we go. All right. And so where we left off was here, right? Now, I actually did add this bump map to it, right? And I want to show you how to do that really quick, and then we can also do some further texturing on this. Uh, so I went to shading uh, menu, right? The shading workspace. And you see what I did was I basically went in here and I created a new uh, texture, right? Um, so I'll just kind of uh, recreate this. I'll delete that. I'll delete that. And remember what you can do, and you see how kind of you lose that bumpiness on this guy. Now, bump maps do work better if they are 32-bit, and you can make your own separate bump map. It doesn't have to be uh, tied to this uh, color map. But in this case, I just think it's going to be a little easier to have them tied together and show that you can tie them together, right? Uh, so what I did is I went to add, right? Because it's good to see some of the shading stuff here because, um, you know, most packages have some version of a shading node network to kind of create more complicated materials. And Blender's is quite user-friendly, actually, um, which is usually the case with Blender. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go down to texture, right? Add texture. And there's the image texture node. So we've kind of seen that before, right? When we click on the little red sphere kind of on the property side, that actually creates this, right? That's what that actually does. When you go over here and you create image texture, it creates this basically, right? You can see those are the same controls. You're just seeing them as actual little kind of nodes, right? Kind of little packets uh, or um, little, you know, things you can move around really. Um, and you'll notice that you can go to open, right? So we can go and we could find that texture where we've been saving it at. And it's, uh, I think, my mainframe color right there. And now you can see that this is loaded in just like this. Now, in this case, what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, drag the color, right? The little yellow dot color. You left click on it. And you could drag it to the normal channel, right? Boom. Now, that doesn't do much for us, right? It's kind of, you can see it's kind of looking a little bit weird there. What we need is we need a, an actual intervening node. Just like with our normal maps, we want kind of an actual normal map node in here. So we go to add, and we go to vector, right? That's where you have things like your normal map, right? So that's where normal maps at if you wanted to create your own normal map stuff. But you'll see at the very top is bump. Now, a bump map is um, it's the uh, slower cousin of a normal map, right? Um, they do very, something very similar, right? They don't actually change the surface of the geometry. And they are using just the pixel color um, of the texture to have light either illuminate or not illuminate those textures, kind of creating contrast and kind of a texture that as you move the light around or you move your view around, it changes. So it looks like there's surface detail there that th there's not. It looks like there's bumpiness, right, textureness. Um, a bump map, though, is um, not as good at doing things like fabric folds, muscle tissues, wrinkles, things that kind of um, sculpting is better at doing at, right? Um, but if you're just using like, you know, textures that you've already created, um, things that are highly uh, geometric, um, anything that's heavily texture based, right? You're actually painting stencils or stamps. Bump maps will actually do a pretty darn good job at, right? Uh, but things like um, fabric folds, um, wrinkles, muscle definition on a character, um, the crevices, sculpting actually captures that nuance a lot better because there's a lot more subtlety to it. Um, of course, sculpting can uh, do all of the stuff as well. So uh, a normal map is actually always as good as a bump map, but bump maps are as good if it's like brick walls uh, and things like that. So I'm going to go bump, and you see it creates a little bump node. And the nice thing about Blender, remember, is if you hover your little node, because once you create it, it's attached, which is neat. You see when you hover it over these lines, they become highlighted. So when you click, it plugs it in, right? Now you notice it's not quite working, though, because this color is plugged into normal. We actually want to take that, and unplug it, so you left click on it, and plug it into height. And when you do that, you see how there's actual bumpiness, right? And you'll notice, you could turn the distance down to like say two and it becomes less intense. You could bring it up higher and it becomes more intense. I think one was actually okay for us, right? Um, because that gave us our um, default. Now you'll notice it gets a little bit kind of, um, grainy here, right? That's because this is not a 32-bit texture, right? You notice when we create textures, it gives us the option to use 32-bit floating. That will create a better bump map. So if you're going to get close, this might not be the exact uh, bit depth of the texture you want, but you're not going to see this mainframe from there. You're going to see it more back here, right? So that's going to be fine for us, right? So the bit depth depends on how close you get to it, and you see how that really does add to it, right? Depending on that. 
Um, distance kind of tends to work better at controlling the amount of bumpiness, though. So, guys, you can actually do bumpiness, right, without a normal map. Uh, normal maps are great and what you want when you're doing sculpting. If you're not planning on doing any sculpting at all, a bump map will usually uh, work just as well, particularly if whatever texturing you're doing is um, based on image painting, right? Texturing with images. So that's how you can uh, actually just create a bump map, right? Now, of course, you could create a whole new texture, right? So we could have, you know, uh, when we created this, clicked on new and made a whole new one and painted it independently of this. But it's kind of one of those things where, hey, let's just make use the same one because you can use the same one. So if you want them to match, you can use the same ones, right? You can use the same ones. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, layering system, there's that layer add-on I was talking about. I, when I sat down and played with it, the free one, it just didn't work that well. So it'll be kind of like, we're just going to avoid relying heavily on layers for our texturing this term. Um, if you guys eventually decide to get B-Painter, that's going to give you your layer system that'll totally work brilliantly. Uh, I highly recommend B Painter at some point if you want to take the core excellent texture paintings of Blender, Blender, Blender tools and making creating multiple layers and multiple uh, textures and different channels a lot easier, right? It's not terribly hard to do it this way, but B Painter really gives you kind of a whole other level of stuff. Um, and you've kind of, kind of seen me dabble with it a little bit on some of the videos I made at home, right? Uh, B Painter is not free though, right? Uh, but the customer service is exceptional. I actually ran into a, a, uh, in 2.91 a bug, and I actually sent a, a bug report to the guy that created it. He got back to me and had it fixed in a day. It was awesome, right? Um, but uh, B Painter is like 40 bucks. Um, the nice thing is once you buy it, though, you can download the newest versions forever in a day. So it's really just a single $40 investment, and it, uh, it really takes the, the painting tools in Blender to the next level. Um, we're not doing that in this class. You guys do not have to spend that, right? <laughs> but uh, just want to give a shout out to Andreas because it's a, it's a really excellent add-on that I was to totally worth having for Blender. Um, Blender's core painting tools are really good though, and it's just it needs still needs a proper layer, kind of easier to paint multiple channel system. Um, but there's some good add-ons that offer that um, for not terribly expensive. All right, so bump mapping, right? Uh, and it's just easier to kind of set it up through the shading network, shading node network. And it's great to get some practice with that because Blender shading node network is quite easy to use, actually. Um, so go to texture paint. Right, we're going to go back to the texture paint uh, one. And what I wanted to do is I just wanted to kind of add, I'm going to just kind of do that to reset it. I just wanted to show you guys uh, another way to paint uh, texture, like actual images on this. Um, and you notice my metalness here. So if I go to my, uh, my red, right, the red ball here you'll notice that that's the roughness, right? I have the Metallica pretty high. I can actually even turn it higher if I wanted to, right, or lower. And Metallic, you see, it kind of darkens a little bit because it's trying to get more and more reflection, but also get the actual color of the color map itself as part of the uh, shininess color. But you see it's the roughness that's making it less reflective or more reflective, right? So that, that's what she said. The roughness controls the spread of the shininess over it, not the shininess itself, right? So specular and metallic control those. Um, and we can bring down specular a little bit itself. Kind of give its own little things. But roughness is actually controlling the spread of that. And you notice how sometimes if you're not planning on painting your own metal map and you want metalness for everything and you basically want the same amount, you don't even have to pl uh, make textures for these, right? You can just control these as numbers and sliders. All right, so in this case, what I want to do is I want to paint some stuff on this color map. So I'm going to scroll up. Um, I'm going to go to the brush painting one, right? Because the, the um, red box is your, or the red sphere is your um, your material itself without having to go to the shading network. But if you go up to the top of the property editors, we have that wrench and screwdriver. That's your paintbrush, right? In this case, uh, I'm going to, it doesn't, probably doesn't matter, but I'll just pick the top one because that was the first one. And I want my paintbrush on. Now, in this case, what I could do is we can go to texture, right, right in here. And what we could do is, of course, we can go to new. Now, in this case, you can kind of see it's here, but it's kind of empty. So that's where I usually kind of go to the uh, red kind of checkerboard down at the very bottom of our property editor. And that's where I can go to open. You see the new texture's already been created right here. So I can go to open. And I can go to metal. I kind of downloaded this earlier. It's got like this little kind of slight rough metal to it. And now we'll see if we go back into uh, texture here. 
it's available. We just make sure to kind of select it. Now, here's the thing. Instead of, and I'll go back to the paintbrush. Instead of using stencil, right, because we know if we turn stencil on, it's going to bring it up. And you can absolutely use that, right? Right mouse button to move it. Uh, shift right mouse button to scale it. Control right mouse button to rotate it. And if you do your, if you put your brush to the sides, it controls that better. It's kind of a little, little touchy if you do it from the middle. But here's the thing. We don't only have stencil, right, in the texture menu. We have other mapping types. View plane, you'll notice, attaches it to the actual brush itself, right? Now, in this case, I have a pretty dark color for it. So uh, what I can do is I could bring that up to white, so it'll paint the normal color. And you see that's bumping it too much. So this is one of those things where I can also just turn down the strength of my brush quite a bit, right? And paint a very subtle one. And actually, I think I want that strength even lower. Remember, you can actually highlight here too, and I'm gonna go like 0 0.02. Come on, point, let's see, point, let's see. Uh, come on, point zero two. you should be able to do it. There we go. Just give me a slight error. And you see we can kind of paint a little bit of subtle kind of bump or color to it. Uh, in this case, it might be a little too low. <laughs> so maybe maybe we'll go to point 0.1. There we go. And you see we can actually kind of paint this bump and this color, right? Now that's where we could always have them separate, right? Um, and if we were to, you know, turn down the bump strength or uh, even disconnect it for the moment, right? So I'll maybe just unplug that for the moment. You can actually see when we go to texture painting, um, particularly if I turn that strength up more, so it can kind of paint a little bit of color there, right? So one of the things you can always do is you can actually just paint a texture that's just going directly over the surface at all times, right? So this is one of those things that you can do, you can feel free to do. If you wanted to have these be fully separate textures, you can, right? Just paint a butt map and a color map independent, create totally new textures for each. But I just want to make sure to show you guys that you can do this, right? And you notice it's just kind of taking that texture and it's just stamp, 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 stamp. So for some of you guys that remember Mudbox from last year, view plane gives you your stamping actually. And if you wanted to go to stroke, you could actually control the uh, stamp spacing right here, right? So there's less, uh, more space in between them. In this case, I just wanted kind of a good general noise on that. But I wanted to remind you guys that you do have the ability to paint different map types. Go back to shading, I can always grab this color, plug it back in height. And so that's pretty, pretty noisy from that. Um, we can always turn that distance down to 0.3 or something like that to make it much more subtle or 0.1. To get it much more subtle, maybe a little bit more beat up. But I did want to just kind of remind you guys that you do have the ability to paint um, bumps. And you notice how since it's the same texture, it's painting them at the same time, right? Uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can have them be independent of each other. Um, and things like the strength of your brush matters. Um, and like I said, if you wanted to use view plane instead of stencil, you could do that. It just kind of takes that texture and uh, paints it, paints it, paints it, paints it, paints it. So it's kind of like your paint, 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 paint. It's like it's like an actual stamp stamp, right? Like a ink stamp. You're pressing it down to get, get the effect you want. Um, in this case, it's kind of a roughed up mainframe, uh, but that's fine. I didn't really want to go too crazy on this. Um, if you wanted to do other stuff with this, you can always, uh, you know, go back to turn texture off. Uh, I like having view plane on by default, um, even if I'm not using a texture. Uh, it just um, does kind of more your normal painting. But we can go to stroke here, and we can always change our stroke method to line, right? And with that on, if we were to go to set our color to like a black, because here's the thing. Um, White will make things look raised. Black will make things look pushed in. If you find like a middle gray, that'll make things kind of be neutral. And I'm making my brush size quite small for this, right? And what I could do is I could actually add some line textures. You can just left click drag to kind of add some cool little texture detailing if you wanted to here. If you wanted kind of like some little, little panel detailing, you could do that. We kind of remember the line from uh, previous stuff, right? So you can easily just kind of add some cool little paneling, just like this, right? And you notice how it's going inward, right? Because that color's dark. If I move this kind of back up to white, you see how it's gonna kind of look raised instead, right? 
Um, and if we pick a middle green, a uh, middle gray, so that's very neutral, right? So with bump maps, um, instead of kind of being um, white is 100% uh, on and black is 0% off, uh, it's actually uh, white is 100%, black is negative 100%, and that middle gray is 0%. That way you can kind of have gray for zero or off, white for uh, raised, and black for depressed or pushed in. And remember, you can pick different stroke methods, right? So once you start understanding, and space is kind of a good default one as well when you're just doing regular color painting. Things like view plane and space are great. But you have drag dot, right? So if I want to add some little rivets here, I could go to drag dots. I could bring this back up to white. Make my brush size a little bigger. And we can just put some quick little riveting on here, right? So uh, in particular, for some of my guys that remember Mudbox, um, in many ways you can already see that uh, Blender right out of the box is just quite cool, uh, quite better, right? It's just, it's um, pretty neat. So yeah, Blender needs a proper layer system and multi-channel painting system. A B Painter basically gives you that. But the actual core painting tools like view plane versus stencil, um, your stroke options are awesome, right? Great. So Blender's actual painting tools are really good. It just needs a better layer, multi-channel kind of brush browsing system. But you see what some of the things you could do with just different strokes and uh, white versus gray versus black uh, for your bump map, right? And that the bump map can add this cool stuff to it. I'm going to go to image, save all images just so those are saved. Remember, go file uh, external data just to make sure uh, things are automatically packed into Blender file. Save that. There we go. Uh, and what I wanted to do now is I wanted to quickly uh, do a little bit of the... Um, the light, the light, the wall light, right? I just want to get you some cool bump mapping there. Uh, so I'm going to go file open because that was kind of new, right? Uh, so I'm going to go file open and I'm going to find our light. There we go. Open that up. And I'm going to quickly go to sculpting first because I want to do a little bit of fabric sculpting on this. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, we're going to go back to our blue wrench or sculpting modifier. I'm going to go to Add Modifier, and I'm going to add Multi-Resolution, right? And I'm going to subdivide, because that's going to give us more geometry to work with, right? And yeah, level 4 is probably going to be fine. You can always turn your level viewport up to match that. And I could easily, if I wanted to, just go in here, and I could scroll down to the cloth brush right here, right? And I'm going to go back up to uh, Wrench and Screwdriver. And like I said, I actually like... Uh, the dynamic uh, simulation area it just works kind of more normally, right? And what I could do, make my brush size a little smaller, and I'll maybe pick, uh, say, uh, pinch perpendicular. So see, there's a bunch of different deformation types, right? Uh, pinch perpendicular. And what I could do is I could just kind of go in here and just sculpt a little bit of the kind of the fabric folds I want in there, right? Maybe make the brush size a little bit bigger. And you see how this can actually start to give us some cool fabric folds actually on this cloth, right? So this is one of those really, really, really cool things that your cloth brush can allow you to do, right? And if I wanted to, I could switch back over and I could do things like grab, right, with a bigger brush size. Remember, the right and left brackets create uh, adjust your brush size, all the radius is there. And I can just kind of grab some of these areas to kind of pull it around a little bit more if I wanted to. But you see how it actually does this simulation effect, right? So it's actually running a cloth simulation on this, right? And this can just give you kind of a cool little bit of cloth, right? If I wanted to, I could hold down shift to smooth things out a little bit in areas. Um, you know, I could always go with the smaller brush size to kind of maybe get a little bit more down there. There we go. But you can get like a little bit of cloth hanging there. And that's one of the reasons I want to do a little bit of the cloth stuff with our like cow or cushions in this. Um, so in this case, uh, we're now ready to bake a normal map out for this, right? Uh, so particularly if we go back to say UV editing um, and you open up your, um, and I'll just go for, for object mode, right? Um, so we can see that. If you go to this little bracket, right? That little kind of V on the side here, right? Um, you go to text tools. Remember, you should have that add-on downloaded and installed. I've talked about it a couple times. I'll probably do some review for it again tomorrow. Um, 
it's in the videos as well. Uh, we notice that when we're in here, we can go up and we can pick a resolution size of this. So we'll say maybe 2048. Although maybe 1024, just to keep, make it a little faster for us. But it depends on what you want. Go to baking here. And it's already set to tangent normal. So we can just hit bake. And that's going to bake the normal map down for us on this guy. And there's the cloth fabric folds, right? Now, the cool thing is we can just hit preview texture. And that'll make a preview texture for this, right? And then I can go back to my wrench, my blue wrench, and I can just get rid of that multi-resolution, right? Now, I'm going to make sure to go to image here and save. So we can save it as a, a tangent. Uh, we're also, of course, going to go file external data, tell it to automatically pack in a Blender file. Usually once you've done that and saved the scene, that that's already on. And I'm going to go back to shading really quick because you'll notice that what it did was it actually has plugged that map into the normal map area here. But you'll notice that what happens here is for whatever reason, that preview plugs it into alpha. It didn't used to do that. So what you do is you just kind of click on the alpha dot and plug it into normal. And then you'll see it working well normally. And then you can, of course, you know, maybe tell it to use the proper UV map, although usually that doesn't matter too much. And you can tell the strength to be up so you can see the kind of fabric folds better. The only thing I've noticed with that preview map in 2.91 is that it, it tries to plug it in the alpha channel instead of the normal. But like I said, it's you just click and move it, right? Super, super easy. We can go to texture paint here. I can minimize this a little bit. There we go. And I'll save that. And of course, we can go to uh, material preview right there. And in this case, we can kind of see it's already plugged into a material. We can go to our um, kind of red dot here, our, our red sphere. I'm going to call this uh, wall light, right? So remember, you can re rename your materials, wall light. There we go. And of course, we could plug into a base color map if we wanted to, right? So there we go. And we'll go to image texture. And of course, we can go new. Let's call this uh, light color. And this is going to be small, so I'll leave it 1024. That's where that 32-bit floating option was. If you want to check that on to have a higher quality texture, it will be a bigger file size, though. Uh, so blank should be fine. Hit OK. There's our color map. All plugged in. And of course, we can go up to our wrench and screwdriver up here. I'm going to make sure to pick the light color. Remember, you have to kind of change this one here. And of course, we can go to fill buckets. And I'm going to pick kind of a, a grayish color for this. And we can just fill in that color there. Or watch Blender crash on me. That was lovely. Um, all right. Well, let's stop recording there. <laughs> um,